Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our Lunch and Learn. Um, uh, these Lunch and Learns are brought to you by the University of Utah Health Resiliency Center. This resource is supported by the Health Resources and Service Administration, HRSA, of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. The contents are those of the instructor and do not necessarily represent the official views of nor endorsement by HRSA, Health and Human Services, or the U.S. government. Um, and today we have with us Jake Van Epps. Um, and we have everyone in listen-only mode. Um, if you do have questions or want to make comments, you can put that in the chat or you can raise your hand and we can allow you access to speak. And we'll get started. Hey, everybody. Uh, thanks for having me. I have the chat open. So if you have a question or a comment, feel free to add it. I think participation enriches all of us. I'll try not to kill you by PowerPoint over the lunch hour. So um, I'm presenting on just some practical positive uh, positive psychology strategies. And just, just to give you a little background on positive psychology. So the person who developed, who's considered largely like the, the father of positive psychology, Martin Seligman, in the 70s, he did his research on what is the behavioral model of depression. And that's like when you put mice into a cup of water that they can't get out of and they struggle to get out and struggle to get out. And then they just end up floating around because they can't get out. It's learned helplessness. And it's like if people can kind of learn depression, can we learn optimism? And so is that like original depression research that kind of ended up fueling his new direction in his career in the 80s and 90s when he started developing positive psychology? It's like, can behaviorally we improve our positive emotional experience? And I also want to say to start out that um, there's some, I think, unhelpful takes on positive psychology, which is like, you should always be happy or should always have positive affect. And that by doing these strategies, you'll never feel distress or negative affect. And that's not the message that I want to give to folks today. Uh, acknowledging our difficult emotional experiences is really important, but so is being intentional about cultivating positive emotion as well. So this is uh, focused on positive emotion, but I don't want anybody to get the idea that they if they're doing it right, that they shouldn't feel distress or negative emotion because that's kind of a myth. So um, uh, kind of to my point, we need to acknowledge and address stress in our lives. That's how we kind of get through those things. Uh, that's how we avoid developing psychopathologies like depression, generalized anxiety, PTSD. Um, but we also want to like take notice of ourselves and are we just focused on and thinking about and elaborating on negative experiences or are we taking time to have a more inclusive perspective and save, savor positive experiences as well? And then lastly, none of it means anything if we aren't embedded in a community. Um, just last week, uh, Vivek Murthy, who is the U.S. Surgeon General, and he was also the U.S. Surgeon General under the Obama administration. So this is his second uh, administration that he's a U.S. Surgeon General. Uh, under both administrations, his number one emphasis has been chronic loneliness. And um, he just announced a World Health Organization initiative that he's heading up globally to try to address chronic loneliness because chronic loneliness is associated with the same level of morbidity outcomes as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. And it has worse morbidity outcomes and health outcomes than obesity. So it's a major public health concern when we're embedded in community and connected to people that care about us and that we care about them, we can tolerate negative experiences and rebound much faster. So I just want to kind of put that out there. So uh, a positive psychology framework, uh, a, a theory of well-being is called PERMA. It stands for positive emotions, engagement, positive relationships, meaning, and accomplishment. And so I just want to go through a few of, I want to go through these factors today and give some kind of helpful strategies about how to engage in each one. I don't mean to overwhelm you all with this chart. I know I'm starting out theoretical here, but um, 
this is uh, this is from um, Barbara Fredrickson's broaden and build theory of positive emotion. And you see the dotted line across the middle of the diagram. Below that is what happens when we had neg when we experience negatively balanced emotions, and above it is when we experience positively balanced emotions. And when we get into a negative emotional space, our thoughts and our actions are the repertoire that we have accessible to us becomes really narrow. Our attention really narrows. Our behavioral response choices and thinking response choices become limited. And that's for good reason. When we're under things like life-threatening situations, we don't have time. Like if a bear jumps out from behind a tree and growls at you, you don't exactly have time to say, well, let me think about all my options here. I wonder if I should climb that tree or I wonder if I should run or if I wonder if I should act big. Like you kind of jump into fight, flight or freeze mode. And that is... Uh, that is um, helpful to us to react to situations more automatically, uh, but it doesn't allow us to kind of come up with new solutions to old problems. It more like puts us back into the way that we typically solve problems, just in, to save the organism's life. On the other side of the emotional balance, the positive emotional spectrum, our attention is expanded our thoughts and our actions that we have available to us to respond to a given situation become greatly expanded. Um, if you think about how kids learn about life and how they start to like incorporate that and act it out, it's often through play and having fun and they take on new social roles and they have fake arguments with their friends and they you know, they, they do all this stuff because they're synthesizing things that they're learning and they're trying it on and they're coming up with new behaviors and actions. Turns out we adults are the same. The more we're in a positive emotional space, the more creative we are and the, and the kind of more synthesized our perspectives are in addressing issues. So that's kind of the basis of the positive psychology movement. And uh, also with Fredrickson is this um, upward spiral theory of lifestyle change. And the idea is, is that when people associate enjoyment with the thought of engaging in a behavior, they're more likely to both intend to engage in that behavior and to actually engage in that behavior. So this can be health behavior change. This can be anything that's kind of related to our own well-being. If we're having fun doing it, we're more likely to do it again. Kind of makes common sense, but sometimes we need to kind of hear it and, and, and put it in front of us as well. So uh, also, this is a classic positive psychology experiment. It's called uh, Three Good Things. Um, and it's been repeated in a number of environments. Uh, the results I'll show you on the next slide are actually healthcare professionals, but it's been repeated in a number of different populations. And again, if we think about psychopathologies like depression, generalized anxiety, PTSD, OCD, a transdiagnostic feature uh, or, or like a cognitive feature that goes across all those diagnoses are expanding on and spending a lot of time thinking about negative experiences which is important. If there's a problem, we need to think about it to solve it. But at the same time, we all know on this call that sometimes those processes can kind of run away. This is basically asking us to do the same thing, but on the positive side of the emotional uh, experience. And so the, ex the, 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 the experiment is a 14 day experiment. At the end of your workday, every day, you ask yourself, what are three things that went well today? How did it occur? What was your role in bringing about that good thing? And then how did you feel? So you're just taking time to elaborate and savor the feeling and what you did to bring about a good thing. And, and that helps us feel more positive emotions and it contributes to more kind of balanced emotional landscape. Now, that 14 day simple behavioral intervention is associated with increased happiness and reduced burnout and improved work-life balance and reduced depression for 12 months. 
And other studies, not the one cited here, have found that it has the similar effect over 12 months, so again, a 14-day behavioral intervention, has a similar effect to taking SSRIs or antidepressants for an entire year on mood and happiness. And so it's a really strong thing. And, you know, I'm not a stickler, like that's the experimental design, but if you just spend at the end of your day thinking about one good thing that happened and what did you do to bring it about and how did you feel? It's a nice way to transition from the stressors of work and to encourage decompression and recovery time when you get off of work. Um, engagement is the second letter in the PERMA model. And this is like, what's filling up your cup today? What, what, what is like making you jazzed about coming to work or living your life? And basically, we want, we want to connect to this quality of aliveness or this um, vibrancy or, of vitality, of renewal. And when we do that, we feel energized, even if it's a stressful, busy day at work or, or at home, uh, we can actually gain energy. Uh, yes, Rebecca, I'm happy to share the slides with Priscilla afterwards. Priscilla, can we share these slides with folks or... Yes, the slides and then the recording will also be available on the employee well-being page. Awesome. Okay. Um, uh, so a classic positive psychology uh, researcher, Chiksamahali, created this concept in the 70s called flow. It's like optimal flow. It's like when we're, when we're in it, we're working hard, but like we're jazzed about it and, and things are coming easy to us and, and we're kind of having fun doing it. And they kind of define this as like a balance between your level of challenge and your skill level, and then also kind of the, the, the meaning and the interest that you have in that activity. And when you have like, you're being challenged, but you're not being, you're not learning helplessness, you know, you're not like failing nonstop, you're making progress and your skill levels are kind of going up and your challenge levels going up together that's when we tend to become more engaged. I know if I reflect over my career, I often leave jobs around four or five years in. And it's because like, I feel like I've kind of professionally plateaued and I'm like ready to learn something new because I'm just doing stuff that I've already learned and I don't feel like I'm being challenged anymore. Um, that hasn't been the case at my current job. Just want to put that out there in case my boss is listening, but you know, um, Lots to be challenged and evolve in this field, which I'm excited about. Um, the, the, the third letter in PERMA is R, and that stands for relationships. And like I already kind of told you, uh, loneliness is associated with a lot of really negative health outcomes. And being connected uh, is such an important strategy for health. Um, uh, you know, I support healthcare professionals a lot after adverse events or difficult events, and we have lots of factors that help support them, and we have calming strategies, and we have leadership behaviors to do, and we have instilling hope and providing safety, but if I really had to boil down what I think the most essential element is for people to get through like a traumatic or stressful time, come out on the other end in a growth oriented place it's by being really connected and grounded in supportive relationships it really makes or breaks a difficult experience um so um you know try to give things that promote connectedness like random acts of kindness now there's been a lot of research on like things like social anxiety disorder where people often will be in an interaction and they'll stutter or they'll say something that wasn't fully thought out. And then all of a sudden they're either afraid of what the other people's thinking, or they get really focused on if they're going to make another mistake on the conversation. And then that's all they're focusing on. And you can't attend to more things then one at a time, the whole like um, divided attention is kind of a myth. Um, 
And so then they start thinking about all the ways they're going to mess up or what the other person is thinking. And then what happens? They do mess up again because they're not thinking on the actual interaction. They're worried about the reaction to the inter interaction. Um, turns out that one of the most effective, complete, and fast ways to deal with social anxiety in an interaction like that is to do an act of kindness to the other person. It just tends to calm people's anxiety. It promotes connectedness and feeling good in the relationship. Uh, and so it's a, it's kind of a really powerful intervention. Um, uh, gratitude. Now, everyone has heard of gratitude journals and stuff like that. In some ways, I think that's like an overplayed positive psych thing. I think it's effective to, again, savor these emotions that are positive, like gratitude. But there's a way to supercharge the exercise, which is, Think about something that you're grateful for that somebody else did to you. So it's a, it's, it's a social gratefulness. Write down what it was and what it meant to you. So you're savoring that experience again. And here's what really kind of uh, seals the deal is reach out to that person and share with them what you just wrote down then everyone's kind of feeling better. It's like a Coca-Cola commercial from, from, from winter holidays or something along those lines. You kind of pay it forward. Um, sorry, I don't really drink Coca-Cola, but it, those commercials always get me. They got the, the good feels. Um, uh, um, receiving. So a lot of people that I talk to, when they're struggling, when they feel like they've made a mistake, the last thing they want to do is to reach out and ask for help from people because they feel really negative about themselves. They think other people might be thinking negatively about them. Or I hear this so much, I don't want to bother anybody with my problems. And, and people think that it's like a burden to, have, to be supported. And they don't want to burden the people that they care about. But my simple response to that is think about a time that a friend was in need and reached out to you and you were able to support them. Did that feel like a burden or is that a positive emotional experience for you? I know for me, maybe I'm biased because I'm a psychologist, but um, I always feel good when I'm able to help people I care about. Sure, there are those some people that don't know those boundaries and will take a lot from you and stuff like that. But that's far that's few and far between. For the most part, reaching out and giving support to people feels good to everybody involved. So be okay with asking for it and receiving that. Um, and let people's compliments sit in. I was just given a, a, a staff excellence award uh, at, the, at the university. And I got to tell you, it was really embarrassing and kind of hard to accept and hear what people were saying about me and stuff like that. Um, and my my boss was like, you got to stop that. <laughs> you just got to let it in, Jake. Um, and it's and it's true. When you just let yourself kind of experience it and like be appreciative for it, you tend to be more humble in your response and gratitude to others and like come across better. Um, and it just feels good to like let it sit a little bit. Okay, meaning. So... How do we derive meaning from our experiences? I think the most surefire way to do that is to be grounded in our values. So even when people are going through really difficult things, like say they got removed from a leadership position or they just got in trouble for making a big mistake at work and got written up, you know, those are really distressing and they're hard to navigate, but we can actually turn it into meaning meaningful experiences if we're grounded in what our values are and let our values kind of guide us through that challenging situation. Values are our deepest desires for how you want to treat yourself, others, or the world around you. And what's cool about values um, is it's like heading west. You know which direction is west. You can keep walking west but you never actually arrive at West because what happens, you just circumnavigate the globe and you're back where you started. So it's aspirational. It's something that we orient towards and always steer towards. Like for example, I want to be a, um, a very supportive, emotionally present, 
uh, uh, never upset father or something like that. Um, you won't be surprised to hear that I fail at that a lot, but those are my guiding values. So when I make mistakes, when I'm not living up to the kind of potential that I hope to be, I just reorient myself. What are my values? How do I get back in alignment with those? And then I feel better and the folks I'm interacting with feel better and stuff like that. So quick kind of a uh, little uh, assignment for folks on the call. Um, here is a list of values. And I want you to think about, I want you to pick out what is your most important value on this list? And this isn't a test. You don't get it right or wrong. It's okay if you're struggling. Just, just pick one that is highly relevant to you. I'll give you a couple seconds to do that. Does everyone have their value just about? So this next slide, I want you to fill out, fill in the blank. So I'm practicing the value of whatever you chose. Today or recently, I have done something in relation to that value. And then ask yourself, would you like to do more or less of that thing? Does that make sense, what I'm asking folks to do? Again, I'll just give you uh, uh, 30 seconds to kind of think through the, the sentence. Do people, would people be willing to write which value they chose into the chat? I'd just love to see a, a bunch of um, values that, that, that people think are important kind of flooding in so I get a sense of what kinds of, oh, whoa, trust, kindness, integrity, connection, openness, connection, uh, holiday cards recently, you're better than me, uh, friendliness, <laughs> honesty, creativity, uh, uh, I feel like, is that like a beer? Um, I think genuineness. Genuineness, sorry. <laughs> I need my glasses. I can't read without my glasses on, y'all, so please forgive me. <laughs> Pairing. Um, uh, these are beautiful. And you know, what's great is that like, there's very little repetition. There's, there's a, a ton of different values expressed here and all are really beautiful. I appreciate folks sharing that. The last one for the PERMA model is achievement. And so again, this is the art of savoring. And I'll also say this, like, uh, as co-workers, as employers, as employees, it is so nice to point out and share achievements with each other. It's, I think it's so easy to focus on corrective action and fixing mistakes and getting people into alignment through like correction, but just as important. And this is true for parents as well. And it's true for friends and romantic partners. When people are recognized for doing something good, they're more likely to do it again. And so we can shape culture, we can shape teams through recognition of achievements and positive experiences just as much as we can through corrective action. So again, this is another little exercise. I'm gonna ask that you all put on your thinking cap for just a second. Now I want you to reflect on an achievement that's occurred within the past seven to 30 days. So a week to a month. What's an achievement that you personally experienced? Now, I want you to ask yourself, what was the best part of this achievement? And then lastly, here's your homework assignment from this lecture. You thought you were just going to be able to come to lunch and passively learn, and you didn't realize you were going to get homework assignments. But um, I'm challenging you to share that achievement with a friend, either in your personal life or your work life, and just share it with them. And you can even blame it on me. Be like this crazy guy, Jake, from the Resiliency Center. He made us do this, so I'm going to do it.
So just to kind of uh, summarize, um, the PERMA model is a way to um, be more engaged and have more vitality and positive emotions in how you go about your life. They're all about kind of adding meaning and savoring positive experiences and being connected in relationships. So um, it's 1227. This is a, um, we have a few minutes. I'm happy to answer any questions that folks may have. Otherwise, I appreciate the participation. Welcome, Eunice. Yeah, happy Thanksgiving, everybody. It's a good opportunity to practice gratitude. <laughs> uh, I, I'm a big fan of the social kindness, but I'm an extrovert, right? So that's kind of where my values lie. Uh, I love social kindness. The three good things is a, or just asking yourself, like, what's one good thing that happened today at work? What did I do to bring it about? How did I feel during it? Like on my drive home or if I'm working from home as I am today, that like five minute transition where I'm closing down my emails and getting ready to go upstairs to see my family. I, it's just a nice way to kind of transition, summarize the day and be intentional about getting out of work. Thanks for your feedback, everyone. Appreciate it. Hope everyone has a wonderful day.